so uh, I'm sure most of you know this, but uh, we have uh, with me here uh, Benjamin Orson Cummings, Hi. producers, directors, yeah. and Carl Johnson, our coach. I want to start out saying what I think everybody here is saying, which is thank you for making this film. Thank you so much. Our pleasure. You're welcome. Brilliant. Thanks for coming to watch it. Brilliant, brilliant piece of work. Um, and uh, before we get into anything about the film, when did Shaquille O'Neal come on board? Uh, Shaquille O'Neal came on board about halfway through the shooting. One of our producers who helped us raise money, Glenn Furman, had, uh, has a foundation that has an art space and Shaq curated a show for him. He goes by the name Shikasso. <laughs> and so they became friends through that and then he showed him what we had, the rough cut, and uh, he responded and wanted to be a part of it, so it was great. Well, that's, that's, that's totally awesome. And, and I think uh, also uh, on the film front, um, you guys are feature filmmakers, so what uh, uh, was the source of coming on to making a documentary film? in general, making a documentary film, and was it because of the bees, or did it work the other way? You wanted to make a documentary and you chose the bees? Uh, it was because of the bees. Uh, a classmate of mine, Ronnie Golson, who's featured in some of the archival footage, and Coach Carl reached out, and they knew, uh, we had gone to school there, and uh, I think as you know from the movie, maybe the days of the killer bees like this, I don't know, no one's sure how much longer it's gonna last, so there was a feeling like now was the time, before it's too late and hadn't necessarily planned on a documentary, but you know, you, you never know what comes up moment to moment, and so uh, you learn from features how to make docs, and we learned a lot about, we look forward to doing another feature learning uh, from the experience of making a documentary. You spend that much time with people filming them for 12 hours while they do their homework, and you pick up a lot of little characteristics that you can maybe think, oh, I'll apply that to writing. And I think a lot of the topics we were already interested in, and especially chief among them, basketball. We love basketball. We played basketball, we watched basketball, and then right. basketball is great. <laughs> Who doesn't love ba hoops? And then our town and gentrification and race and education and the criminal justice system. I mean, I'll pat ourselves on the back. I think we covered a lot of ground in 82 minutes. <laughs> well, that's, that's the deal. And I mean, whether it's feature films or whether it's documentaries, it's about storytelling. And the tell, you can tell a lot of stories in a feature film, uh, but you can tell maybe even more stories in a documentary because you, you build it around basketball, but it's built around where's the basketball being played. So you have this community, which is, you know, we're all part of this community. And we know what's going on here and what has been going on here. So getting that history together. Um, I mentioned just quickly, we, we met with Carl at the Candy Kitchen was our first meeting to see if we actually were going to, you know, do it, how we both, and we had discussed, like, is it okay to do more than basketball? Can we cover some of these other things that are on everyone's mind. And then we brought it up with Carl and you know, he started pulling out tax maps. Like, we gotta, we gotta do more. Like, you need to show <laughs> about the King Cullen story and they took all the money. And he, he wanted to get into some of those things too. So we were relieved and obviously it's about basketball, but you know, that stuff was important and he, he was willing to talk about it. That's the way he saw it as well. He's like, it's, it's, it's a lot more than basketball. Well, it obviously is, and because there's been other championship teams in different sports, but because of the Killer B situation, because of the Bridgehampton situation, which you got into, that, that whole narrative of the school being endangered. And, and just as a quick question, where did you get the archival footage for, like, during the Save Our Schools, the beginning of the Save Our Schools movement and things like that? Well, Carl had a bunch of tapes, and then um, Coach Niles' son, um, uh, Joe Niles' son, had a, a, huge, a huge box, box full. that he sent us, massive. Massive. VHS tapes, vintage. Yeah, that's nice. Uh, and then what about the, uh, the as that also the source of the old basketball tapes um, from the, the earlier games, earlier Killer B games? Yeah, the one you saw me um, as a player, that was just for me, that was just like a little collector's item I kept for myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's well it curated. It would come one day and, and then it did. And so when you, when you went to cut it together, um, you're you're looking at these different narratives, and so did you. You want to build it around this season. Which which year was this season? This was now two seasons ago, uh, as they attempt to defend their right. most recent state title. Okay. So 16, uh, 15, 16. 15, 16. Yeah. Okay. So um, and when did you you agreed to do this film? Uh, how far in advance of the season? Um, a couple of months. Uh, we met in late during the late summer. At Candy Kitchen, uh, we uh, talked over the phone a couple of times. 
uh, we were going back as the defending champs. And uh, it was a great storyline the year before because uh, I got into coaching. I never thought I was going to coach that long. And I had promised myself, which I broke, that I was never going to coach any of my uh, ex-players' kids. <laughs> and uh, the year before, I had, I think, three, four kids that I had coached. And then a couple of their nephews and stuff like that. So I stayed a little longer than I anticipated, but it turned out for the best. Absolutely. So, uh, so you're, you've agreed you're going to make the film. Did you start shooting? How far in advance of the season did you start shooting? Uh, Thanksgiving, right? First day was the community house Thanksgiving luncheon. Okay. And we shot uh, through the final game with one day of picking up some extra stuff in early summer. And those practices, the first practices we shot were at 5 a.m. I mean, that was the team practiced every morning at 5 a.m. I couldn't believe, I mean, being in high school and getting up there as early. <laughs> it was shocking. <laughs> It's shattering. It's really awful. Yeah, that was tough, you know, but, you know, that was the only gym time we had. Either that we go at six, you know, we, I had to be there at like five. The kids would get there around 5.30, 5.45. We start practice at six, or we go late at night. Yeah. Well, I prefer early morning than late at night. Well, yeah, I think it's better for a lot of different reasons, but I liked what you said at the time, which was, uh, so sooner or later you're going to be getting up to go to a job every day, so exactly. it's, this is just exactly. the season. <laughs> they came in grumpy, but I was also grumpy, too, so <laughs> it didn't matter. <laughs> yeah, grumpy might be good for getting out on the court. Um, so you're, you're going to shoot this season, you're going to do that, so now you start to build the story around that of, of the, the inequality in the community in, in following... Not only that, but the, the story you're telling about the, the, uh, this saving the school and that the school is always in danger. So you want to tell that story. You want to tell the story about the turnpike versus the, you know, gin lane and so forth. So, so how are you building that in as you're shooting the film? Well, I would say we had a plan, you know, in the beginning, and you don't ever know if it'll all turn out exactly like the plan. It came pretty close to the plan, but then some things like uh, are rather uh, fortunate in the moment. Like we were shooting uh, Vivian, the elderly African-American lady outside the community center who had the championship hat. And we had just finished shooting. We were like, how are we going to find someone to you know, give us a tour the other side. Of, of the land, the lay of the land for people who don't know? And right when we had said it, uh, Vince Workasitas pulled up in that Maserati. Black Maserati. <laughs> and we're like, Vince? Dressed head to toe. You know, that's black. our guy. Like, he's, there's never going to be a better guy than that. No, there isn't. And so, that's and then a, that's he was That's a gift thrilled. from God, that guy right it was there. A gift, and it was fate, and that was not planned. And so, um, and then we're like, well, he won't do it, you know, and it'll be tough. And he was like, let's go right now. Let's, and off we went. No, the day that happens is the day you buy a lot of lottery tickets right there because uh, and then following him and obviously he agreed to the whole thing so then that's just yeah. one, one scene after another was just like He's a very everybody around guy. me everybody around me as we went we returned to him it was like oh my god I don't believe it. <laughs> He's but, a captivating character you yes, can't yeah. take your eyes or ears off him Absolutely so um, uh, getting to something uh, a little more uh, heavyweight uh, what is the story on Julian Johnson? Uh, he's sentenced to 18 months and he's still there. What, what, what happened you know, it's, there? It's, it's sad, but you know, that's how our system works. Um, he went in for a minor you know, charge. He ended up spending 14 years there and it was kind of sad. You know, but then again, also once you, I don't actually know what happened, but he had to do something also while he was there. You know, whether it was, who knows? Right. But, you know, once you get that, then it gets tacked on from, you know, that's how it happens. But, like, yeah, he went he's out my now, right? He's out now, but then again, he had a relapse. So he's, you know, it's, it's sad. But that was his choice, though. He could have did 90 days or, or 18 months. He chose to do eight months because he didn't want to be on probation anymore. Yeah. So any slight thing he does then he has to go back. So he he chose in his his mind, I don't want probation once I come out again. I just want to be a free man, right. basically, free of everything. So that's where it is. It's sad. So we, um, we, Julian used to come to our house to play basketball when we were kids growing up here. So we that's how we knew him. And when we heard that he was there, and we like, well, it was very personal because we knew him. We thought it was made sense to go to Elmira, which yeah. 
you know, it's a horrible place. No, I film. understand Awful. that. I mean, and I think that what was one of the many telling things about the film was his, his own candor and his own acknowledgement of what his path has been and what he'd like his path to be. So, Like he said, he, he grew up in the Gray family. Uh, he had his choices. He went to school. And people don't even know this. He went to the Navy for he passed boot camp, everything. And uh, he just couldn't get out of his own way. Maybe he was just too smart for himself. You know, thinking he can just, you know, get by or get, you know, or, you know, just outsmart everyone. And yeah. that's not how life works. Well, he said that he was brought up with the right values and he just didn't apply them. They were there, but he just didn't apply them. And that, yeah. that honesty and that, uh, that footage was, was really telling. But it, but it all, I mean, the, one of the many great things about the film is the way that it was knitted together was that you you stayed with the personal stories of some of the team members. Obviously, you can't do the whole team, but those different things. And one of the most telling things of editing and, and shooting was um, when we get back to Jamar and we're talking about um, what are your you know plans. I'm going to be the first one to go to college. I don't know what that feels like, but I'm going to imprint this on my life story. And then and we're being evicted again. And that's enough of a body blow, but then it cuts from there to the national anthem. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that that wasn't lost on me of what the story that you're telling is. So that, that kind of editing. And some of that is, as you say, on the fly, but some of that is intentional, yes? We got plenty of time to make that decision in the edit, and we owe a lot to our editor, Alex Bayer, and yeah, that was on purpose. Yeah, yeah. I would also say that Jamari, that scene where he was telling you everything about being evicted was um, a pickup day. It was like an extra day like we had shot the whole time. And part of the process of making a documentary is um, trust and earning trust and like you know he was very quiet he really didn't wasn't a part of things for a while and obviously he had a lot on his mind and then he started sharing some and then at the end he said he wanted to tell us some more stuff so we went for another day of interviewing and like and that was when he told us all that and you just you know everybody was wet in the eyes yeah, yeah. this is too much absolutely um, the the the, the, the shots at the end, uh, when, the, when the game is going down, and it, we're, just, we're at the verge of coming back, and then it starts to go down. And that is the whole montage that ties together the rest of the film, where we have the look at the well-to-do neighborhoods, and we have the look at the hood, and we look, you know, we look at the whole thing. And it's, it's like our lives, the team's lives are flashing before their eyes, but it's also the film is flashing before our eyes. So uh, how, talk about that a little bit, how you put that together. Well, sports in general are a great tonic, especially when you or your team are winning. <laughs> and when it doesn't go your way, the real world has a way of uh, showing up again. But in the end, also, we were talking a lot, too, about what are the stakes. You know, like, when you, when you make a film, you're like, why do people care? What are, the, what are the stakes? And for us growing up out here, and a lot of people, I think, you know, you like, feel like it was a much more diverse community when we grew up. And it's slowly being hollowed out. And it's the market forces. And it's, you know, but at the same time, if you liked having culture, in a diverse community, it's kind of tragic. So you want to see, like, I think one of the reasons this was the time to make it is it feels like we're near some tipping point in some ways for sometimes. They get, you know, but then the team always comes back. So, well, and well, then Fred Thiel, do. Fred Thiel does a good job of laying it out that, uh, you know, they're not literally playing for the school, the survival of the school, but they're not unrelated. Oh, no, absolutely not. And I think that's not only to Thiel's credit, but again, to the filmmaking, because we have him saying before that game with, again, going to a budget hearing first and then seeing what's on the line, which at the stakes to some extent, and yes, you're not playing for the future of the school, but he's saying there is this expectation when you have this program and it's done so well and everything's on the line, there's this expectation you're going to win and that's, that's what's going to bail you out. And then if you don't win, and then again, all the documentaries that we've seen, and, and this is no exception and it's a perfect example, is what what does the human spirit do in the face of obstacles, in the face of adversaries, in the face of challenges, and looking at, at what they did. And so there's the loss, and the access you had was incredible to kind of very emotional situations. But they come back, and they come back to a hero's welcome because they're loved by their community, which is that's as good a way as you can finish a, a film like that. I don't know. I thought it was a, a tremendous triumph for everybody, uh, and not to mention you guys. Um, well, I think, you. though, we should have Tyleek and Josh sent to Washington to 
argue in, before Congress about the tax, tax policy. I was, I was and gonna they tell you. really articulate the major thesis in both sides. Uh, I was They're very say, fair and balanced. I was going to say and, the timeliness um, I think of that. We should send this. I mean, to how them. did you, how do you know the tax bill was going to be in front of us at that time? Because he obviously has the solution. It's we've been taxes. We've been holding on to this. Well, Tyler is a libertarian. <laughs> yeah. But uh, and and the the other side of the argument is like, hey, they they made mad money, you know. They, they must have done something. I, I wish they had done something, but not so much. A lot of them, uh, except carve up the real estate. So, what else would you like to say about this uh, film uh, for going forward? What's what's happening to this film now? Uh, obviously, you you cleaned up at the uh, Hamptons International Film Festival, uh, and uh, and where does it go now? What happens next? Well, we're working towards uh, a distribution deal, so it'll be hopefully on Netflix or Amazon or something like that, where everybody will get a chance to see it. Yeah. And uh, are, do you have plans to uh, make more documentaries? You want to go back to a feature film? You got something, some projects in mind? What are you, what are you up to these uh, days? We have a feature project next, and the next documentary subject. TBD. It's TBD, but definitely want to do it again. It's great, I and mean, I think documentaries are having a moment now in many ways. You know, it used to be really hard to get them seen, and now with the Netflix, Amazon, everything. I mean, people watch a lot of documentaries, and um, it's a nice counterpoint to the superhero movies. You know, to get something real, and oh, absolutely. it seems to be more of a demand. Well, and it and it's uh, what, the other thing. It's a great counterbalance too, which is really badly needed in my view. But um, is the whole reality television concept, which is as far from reality as you can get, and documentaries actually give you the truth, mm -hmm. as and reality in ways that reality television never does. So that kind of storytelling is is really important and uh, and beautiful that you guys are doing it. So um, I don't. I think we maybe have a, qu a moment for a couple of questions. Yes. Anybody? Right there. Uh, yes, um, all on with the college. Uh, Jamari's up at Fredonia State, his second year. Doing very well. Um, Ty Lake is at University of New Haven. Josh was at Dell High, but they've been growing up, since, they've known each other since they were three years old. So Josh decided to transfer to Ty Lake. Uh, Matthew is at the University of Rhode Island. So they all doing well. Uh, Elijah Jackson was a junior that year. So um, he's at Suffolk now. He's just graduated this past summer. So they all went to college and they all doing very well. Anybody playing ball? Anybody you know, that's a funny thing. Um, I think they got burnt out. <laughs> and uh, none of them, you know, they had talked and called me and said, should I go out for the team? And I'm like, yes, you can be very valuable. I'm not saying you're going to be the star. Uh, and then, you know, they call me back saying, nah, we just want to go to school, enjoy, enjoy the rest of their lives. So basketball is not, would they like to work for the basketball team? Yes. Or some kind of organization. But right now, no, they're just enjoying college. Josh and Ty Leek were recruited a little bit, right? There are a couple of schools They were recruited. They had some interest. But, uh, you know, in that, that season, which people didn't know, Ty Leek had a, he was playing hurt. He had a torn MCL. And he played the remaining two months, which, you know, it could be very painful. So he can do a lot of things. So, like I said, if we, a little luck here, breaks, injury free, you never know what could happen. But he's, they just said they don't want to play anymore. And that's fine. Okay. Anybody else? All right. Last question, I guess, what I'm being told. Go ahead. What are, what are you up to, uh, Coach? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm still working at the school. Um, I retired from coaching. Last year was my last year. But then I got roped into coaching 5th and 6th grade PAL. So we'll see how that goes. <laughs> Future is bright. <laughs> I just couldn't give it up. Uh, I, I don't know. I would probably went crazy this winter, just like sitting around. I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. So pretty soon you'll be uh, coaching the grandchildren of the people you pleased to play with. <laughs> No, PAL is a little more relaxed. <laughs> you know, the biggest victory in PAL is so funny is we never talk about winning or losing. We talk about playing, how to play the game the right way. We practice hard, get better each day. And if they can make a layup, that's a victory. And that's okay. I like to see the smile on their faces. Make a layup and then give you five push-ups. <laughs> give me five push-ups, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <there> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much for you guys for making the film. Thanks, Carl, for coming down.